Hello everybody, my name is Rachel and welcome to another weekly wrap-up. This time I'm wrapping up five books that aren't from last week but the week before that, just trying to limit the number of things that I'm talking about in every video because... I've been making some very long wrap-ups recently. <laughs> the first one is Death with Interruptions by Jose Saramago. Saramago was a Portuguese author. He won a Nobel Prize in literature. I didn't know that until I started reading this book. Um, Saramago is not an author that I ever thought I was going to read, except that I read Words Are My Matter by Le Guin last year, and she uh, has a lot of essays and book reviews in that collection. And some of them are about Saramago's works, which she speaks of very highly. So I decided to try one just to see if I liked it or not. So the premise of Death with Interruptions is pretty straightforward. At the beginning of the new year, at midnight on New Year's Day, death stops in an unnamed, probably European country. Nobody dies. And all of the dead but not actually dead people start piling up. The first half or so of this book is just a description of how the government, the king, the funeral directors, uh, the mafia <laughs> react to this problem of, you know, it's, it's the population crush when you have all these people dying, but they don't actually die and you can't get rid of them, but people are still being born. It's like, where do you put everybody? And it's very interesting, that whole discussion of, of people's reaction to, oh, I'm going to live forever. Wait, I might just be endlessly dying forever. <laughs> the second half kind of switches gears and death becomes personified as a woman who comes into the country and falls in love with a cellist, or at least becomes kind of obsessed with him. I think I really preferred the first half of this book over the second, just because, you know, death, woman, of course she falls in love with a mortal man, that kind of thing. I don't, I'm not super interested in that, to be honest. But the entire thing was fascinating because of Saramago's style. This is the thing that I expected to really not like about this book. Saramago has um, an odd relationship with punctuation, let's say that. <laughs> there, there are these endless like comma splices where you have a complete sentence joined with another complete sentence with a comma and a whole page of dialogue where it's all one paragraph even though people are, are switching their lines and everything and I knew that this was going to happen and I thought I would really hate it but actually it wasn't that difficult I mean I could just substitute my own mental punctuation I never got lost and actually those endlessly rolling clauses ended up making really beautiful sentences it just it just flowed so well and I, I kept reading and you know, like one sentence is an entire paragraph and an entire paragraph is one page you just there's no good place to stop you just keep going and it really was a beautiful read I'm not sure that I came away from it feeling anything deep and meaningful about death and life or whatever except that I think the book is kind of commenting on um, how we define life by death and death by life and if you don't have one of those then what's the point? I mean it, it, it disrupts everything. <laughs> I will probably try something else by Saramago. I don't think all of his books will be for me but the other one I want to try is The Stone Raft. I think this is one where like a part of Europe breaks off and this couple is on it while they're drifting around. I have no idea what it'll be like but it sounds weird and I want to try that. <laughs> Woman on the Edge of Time by Marge Piercy. This is one of the rare books that has taken me more than a month to read, even though it's not that big of a book. I started reading this at the end of March. I didn't read any of it in April. I don't think I read any of it in May, and I finally finished it in June. I just sat myself down and said, Rachel, you're going to read the last third of this book and finish it. <laughs> Because it's not a bad book. I think it's very decent and it, apparently it's very meaningful to other people, but I hated reading large portions of it just because it was so brutal. Um, the main character, Connie, is a Hispanic woman in I think the 1970s, and the fact is she is poor, she is a, a woman of color, and she may or may not be mentally ill. Um, she has been 
in and out of a mental institution before and then she is institutionalized again by her family after a horrible event involving her niece and her niece's pimp and you know and she is contacted by a woman from the future who basically tells her you have the ability to kind of time travel to the future and you don't really know if Connie is actually schizophrenic or mentally ill or if this is a real thing happening and I guess it doesn't really matter if it's real or not that doesn't take away from the experience and what Connie learns and what she decides to do and everything but it's, a, it's an interesting debate about whether it's real or not so the reason that I hated reading parts of this is that everything bad that could possibly happen to Connie does happen um, She's been, she's poor, she's been beaten, she's, I think she's miscarried, she had her daughter taken away from her when she was addicted to drugs and may have abused her. She's been committed to a mental hospital where pe people are treated like animals, you know? And that is some of the hardest stuff for me to read, is just these, these doctors and nurses coming around and drugging people and not actually helping them but making it worse. Connie's family basically signs off on this experimental medical procedure to cut her head open and put things in her brain and you know like lobotomy type stuff and it's it's terrifying and tragic and just it made me so upset to read parts of this book so I, I finally powered through and I can't say that I enjoyed the book at all, just that it was it was a very emotional read, it's very hard hitting, it has a lot of commentary, and I think at the end of the day, I just really hope that the world has improved somewhat. I mean, I know things are still awful, <laughs> but hopefully not this bad. So that's The Woman on the Edge of Time. Next up, I listened to a very short collection of essays by Oliver Sacks called Gratitude. Oliver Sacks was a neurologist and a very popular author of books, kind of vignettes about the neurological, uh, psychological cases that he came across in his practice. Um, he's very well known for books like Awakenings, which was made into a movie, uh, The Man Who Mistook His Wife for a Hat, Music Affiliate, which is my favorite by him, and Hallucinations, and a bunch of others. Um, I haven't read all of his books, but the ones I have read I really enjoyed. Um, Sachs died a couple of years ago, and these essays are the last ones that he wrote about the end of his life, looking back at his life, um, and, and dying. I think all of these are available online for free. I just listened to the audiobook because I, I needed something to listen to at the time. Um, and yeah, they made me really sad, but also Sax was a really wonderful person. He he wrote so well and humanely about his patients and, and his his work is just fascinating to read, educational, and I've always appreciated that he puts people at the heart of things. His his patients are not just case studies, they're they're people and he, he humanizes their conditions and everything. So yeah. These final essays were, were very sad because, you know, it was the end of his life and he knew it was coming and I think it was too soon, uh, but they were really great to listen to. Then I read Junk DNA, A Journey Through the Dark Matter of the Genome by Nessa Carey. You may remember that I read her first book, The Epigenetics Revolution, a little while ago for the A to Z readathon, and I really enjoyed it. I really like reading about genetics, and this book, uh, Epigenetics Revolution, introduced me to a couple of ideas, some revolutionary things that I had no idea about. So I immediately went out and got Junk DNA to read because it expands upon the one topic from Carrie's first book that I wanted to know more about, and that is how the part of the human genome that we call junk DNA isn't actually junk. Um, this goes back to the earlier days when the human genome was first sequenced. Uh, it was basically said that 98% of it didn't do anything because it didn't code for proteins. And scientists for a long time have worked under the assumption that um, any DNA that doesn't code for proteins doesn't really do anything and isn't something they want to research. However, I think in the last 10-15 years, um, 
people like Nessa Carey have been investigating this and discovered that actually junk DNA may be really important <laughs> and it does code for other things, just not proteins. So this book, Junk DNA, covers a pretty sizable uh, amount of material that was also covered in the epigenetics revolution, but then it kind of expands upon that. I just found the entire thing to be fascinating um, and very enlightening about, you know, how complex DNA and, and genomes are and how we think that we know a lot about what the genome does and actually we know a very, very little. And it's, it's pretty difficult to uh, come up with experiments to target certain things and, and find out more. Uh, if we, we don't really know how some of these things work. We think we know the process, but not how and, and why it actually works. So just this took me straight to my happy place. And also, junk DNA is written differently from the epigenetics revolution. Um, the epigenetics book was like very dense and technical. And in junk DNA, Carrie decided to not use a lot of the technical terms. She's a little bit vaguer, relies more on analogies to explain things, and then anything that's pretty technical gets put into footnotes. So I think that Junk DNA is uh, far more readable to the layperson than her first book was, but I actually missed some of that technical stuff because that's that's what I want at this point. Uh, but this one, this book may be a better one for just a beginner to jump into and read if you are interested in genetics. If you haven't read a lot of prior material, it's just, it's easier to understand. I think both approaches of her books are perfectly fine and valid. It's just what you prefer, I suppose. And the last book for this video is Phantom Pains by Michelle Baker. This is the sequel to Borderline, which came out last year. This series is urban fantasy, and the main character, Millie, has borderline personality disorder, so she has a mental illness. She tried to commit suicide before, and she survived, but she lost both of her legs and suffered mild brain damage. In the first book, she is invited to join the Arcadia Project, which manages the relationship, the connection, <laughs> between the human world and the fey world. So it's difficult to talk about this without spoiling the first book too much, but uh, let's just say at this point Millie has left the Arcadia Project under bad circumstances, but then her former partner seems to reappear as a ghost, and then a member of the Arcadia Project is murdered, and Millie comes back to help find out what happened, who who did this, um, and also to kind of defend the woman, Carol, who had asked her to join the Arcadia Project. And that's really vague, um, but I really liked this. I think it was just as good as the first book. I actually had a really long conversation with Tara and Paul about this book because we read it and we discussed it, and it was interesting what we were talking about, what we had noticed, and what we think the next book uh, might have in store. Given the ending of this one, I really don't want to spoil it, but I want to talk about where the ending of this book is going for the series. I think what I liked the most about this particular installment in the series is that it definitely shows growth for Millie with dealing with her, her physical disability and her mental illness. There are multiple points in the book where she stops and she like thinks about something she learned in therapy to help her accomplish something, to get through something. Um, she's always trying to get to her um, therapy group meetings and stuff because like she doesn't want to lose the money that she paid for. She doesn't want to get kicked out. She knows she has to go to her therapy sessions and everything. The first book was very impressive and caught a lot of people's attention because it is an unusual book that has a character with a mental illness and a physical disability and done well. So that was very new and fresh. And then the second book might possibly feel like a bit of a letdown because it's not that new anymore, but it, it continues 
on that journey with the character dealing with these issues. And I thought that was, that was really well handled. The other thing that I really enjoy about this book and about the series is that Baker's style is so readable. These books are quick and easy to read. It's not a bad thing. They're just, they're just really enjoyable books and you want to keep reading one more chapter and I love that feeling. Um, I am not really into urban fantasy. Most urban fantasy series hold no interest for me whatsoever but this one I am hooked on and I cannot wait for the next book. That is it for this video. I may have to resort to doing five book wrap-ups like I've seen a lot of people doing this year because clearly the weekly wrap-up method has not been sufficient for the number of books I've been finishing. I've been on vacation for the last nine days and I read a book every single day, in some cases two because I was reading comics. So I, I have another backlog to catch up on. Anyway, thank you guys so much for watching. If you have read any of these books or if you want to and you want to talk about them, please leave me a comment down below because I would love to talk to you. And I will be back once again in my next video. And until then, bye.